Well, thanks for coming out, everyone. Uh, as Dave said, my name is Alan Wilson. Um, I've been here at Adobe for about eight years, and I work as a designer on our product team for the Experience Cloud. And uh, as you can probably tell, I'm a bit of a data visualization nerd. Um, but let me talk a little bit about what the Experience Cloud is. If you're anything like my friends or family, when they hear I work for Adobe, they get really excited and then I tell them I work for the Experience Cloud and they get this confused look on their face. They're like, oh, okay. So the Experience Cloud started about 10 years ago when Adobe acquired a little Utah company called Omniture. Uh, since that time, we've acquired some other companies and we've slowly built out uh, an Experience Cloud, which allows uh, larger organizations to uh, tailor their experiences for their users. So organizations like uh, Major League Baseball or Disney. Um, these aren't small products that you just buy over the counter. They're pretty big deals. And like I said, I was a bit of a data viz nerd. Uh, this is a chart I made when I was trying to figure out what type of board game to buy that I could play with my children. Um, and uh, I think I finally settled on a couple that would be good candidates. Um, I do like board games. Sometimes I like to pick them apart and see how they tick. This is a, a favorite of mine. Um, and as a designer, I get asked to design t-shirts for family reunions. And this was one I made a couple years ago because the family had gotten a little big. My, my grandparents started with two and uh, at this point in time, 2014, there were 179 family members. It was getting a little confusing, especially for the in-laws to keep track of who was who and who belonged where. And so this uh, infographic I uh, created on the back of the t-shirt so everyone could kind of point to themselves like, that's me. <laughs> and it was handy. Um, I also uh, play video games and try and get better at them. This is a visualization of an embarrassingly large number of Hearthstone games I played, almost 5,000, in an attempt to figure out what was the strategy that was working best for me. And one work-related visualization, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to see it when you were walking in, but this is a, a couple of the visualizations we use in our network operations center. Whoops and uh, partnered with uh, Aura Studio to create these halos at the top. I didn't invent those, but I think they're pretty cool and they work really well for what we use them for. But you're probably not here to, to learn about me and uh, the things I do in my free time. Um, we're here to talk about how we can uh, tell stories with data. And the first thing we need to understand when we're talking about data storytelling is the difference between exploring and explaining. So we typically start out with a process, something like this. We start with some data and we have some questions that we want to answer. And so we'll visualize that data in a way that helps us understand things, which prompts other questions and other uh, information. And eventually we arrive at some sort of insight. And it's only natural that we want to share that insight with uh, our audience. That might be, you know, uh, a group of friends. It might be some random strangers on the internet, or it might be our boss. And by instinct, we have all these artifacts that are left over from that exploration process that we wanna just transfer over. They help me understand my data, so why not use them to help my audience understand the data? That's actually not typically the best route to take. You don't wanna take those artifacts. Instead, you want to take the time to craft a story that's custom tailored to share that insight, to help your audience understand what you need them to understand and cut out all the other things. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you can divide this, this uh, kind of process into two categories, the exploratory phase and the explanatory phase. Now, some of the things that make these different are the story. When we're exploring our data, the story is unknown at this point. Um, we're there to discover. Uh, but when we're explaining, the story is a known thing, and it, the whole point is to explain it clearly to someone else, which brings us to audience. The audience is not me when I'm explaining. When I'm exploring, it's typically me or a small group, and so I can be a lot more uh, agile and sloppy, if you will. But when we're explaining, we need things to be nice and clean. 
The goal of the exploratory phase is to understand, as I mentioned, and while explaining is to communicate. And the outcome is quite a bit different too. Exploring, the outcome is that insight, right? Um, but when we're explaining things, we usually do so with an action in mind. We want the people we're sharing this information with to do something about it, to take action. I think uh, Hans Rosling put it really well when he said that having the data is not enough. I have to show it in a way that people enjoy and understand. So let's talk about how we do that. Let's talk about story crafting. So any good story, be it a movie, be it a book, or be it a PowerPoint deck, needs to have a narrative. And a good narrative starts with characters. Now these don't always have to be people, right? Sometimes our characters are a board game, like we looked at earlier, or some other interesting data point, but you need to know who your actors are, who your characters are, to be effective in your, in your narrative. A setting is also important. Um, Obviously, this could be a physical place, but time plays a big role as well. A point of view is really important to have. Who is telling the story? What are their motivations? Why are they telling the story? And last of all, you need some theme. This is our insight, right? right? This is the point. This is the whole reason for crafting our story. And as I talk through some of the principles today, I want to use this example from 538. Um, it comes from Benjamin Morris, and he's talking about sumo wrestling, a topic we're all super into, followed daily, I'm sure you've all caught up on the latest. Um, and let's take a look at the narrative that he constructs here. So he starts with three characters, these three wrestlers. I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to pronounce their names. Um, and the setting is this match in 2016. Um, but it's more than that, too, because the funny thing about that match is it lasted exactly one second. And the whole story explains why that still matters and why that's significant. And he goes through 250 years of history to explain that. We're looking at this through Benjamin's point of view. Uh, Benjamin knows a lot about sumo wrestling, and he's trying to bring us into this world and help us understand what's going on here. And the theme really is about just introducing us to this world of, of wrestling and this sport that started in Japan and why this specific moment in time, this tournament, uh, and that one second match matters to us. So as he does this, he's going to leverage uh, both logical elements and emotional things. Uh, the, both of these things work hand in hand. We tend to kind of put them in buckets and separate them. But really effective storytelling leverages both of these things effectively. And he's going to be using several key artifacts, right? There's going to be a lot of writing, a lot of text, and charts, and images. Because uh, we're talking about data storytelling, I'm going to spend a lot of time today talking about charts, but we'll also touch on images and text and the way they can uh, help a story. So let's talk about visualizing data. When we're visualizing data, we often start with a question like this, which chart should I use? This is actually a really bad starting point because it doesn't give us anywhere to go. Like that question is very open-ended. It's much better to start with the insight. What is the insight I want to share? What's the point that I want to get across? And if we're equipped with that, and we can think about it in terms of maybe it's an interesting distribution that I'm trying to help someone understand, or maybe it's a change over time that was unexpected, or an unusual place, or a comparison, or maybe my whole story is about the relationship between two things that people don't typically uh, associate. If you start there, you can use a tool like the graphic continuum. And what this does is it uses those questions as a starting point and then feeds you a whole list of charts that are good at answering those sort of questions. Um, and they divide them into these six main categories. You can see there's 60 charts here, um, which is still only scratching the surface, but it gives you a really good starting point and a frame of reference as you start exploring ways to tell your data. You can download that here. So let's look at our SUMA example again. This is a, uh, one of the first charts 
And the point they're trying to make here, the story they're trying to tell, is that sumo wrestling is really old. Even though this chart is about net wins and each one of these lines is a wrestler, what really makes this chart sing is the timeline and these little annotations along that timeline. You start to put things in perspective. You see when the first Super Bowl was, relatively recent in history, all the way back down to the Declaration of Independence, which happened after this uh, sport really got off the ground. And to make it even more real, they show how the data was collected. On the left here, we see um, what a record looks like from the 1700s. And on the right, we see what it looks like in 2016. So even though this sport is 250 years old, it remains largely unchanged. Uh, in this part of the story, they're trying to help us understand how height and weight play a role in winning. Makes sense, right? These guys are huge. They must be huge for a reason. Being more huge is probably an advantage. But apparently that advantage wasn't static through time. It varied a little bit. And this chart ex helps ex explain that. And then those handprints, again, from seven, uh, the 1700s and then from modern time help us understand uh, how big these wrestlers were and that they were real people. And then we come to this chart, one of the most complicated. Um, it's a scatter plot showing a number of variables, but they call attention to two wrestlers here, uh, two dots, which uh, does a couple things for us. It helps us know what the dots are, but it also helps center the story on two major characters. And then they show us what those characters look like and who they are. We start to feel like we know them. We get not only the logical tie-in, but the emotional one. One thing that sets good charts apart from the really excellent ones is good design. And design really um, can be boiled down to visual hierarchy. So much of design is just this. Um, I learned it in school and I keep learning it. And it's something that was difficult for me to grasp, but I wanna share a few insights that I've gained over the years that I hope will be useful to you. Now, when we hit a wall of text like this, Initially, we may think that our audience is going to read this left to right, top to bottom, straight through like you would a book. But we don't. Our eyes jump around the page because of the way it's organized. We tend to grab these bullet points first, and then we might work our way back to a large section of text. And we might skip the rest altogether, feeling like we got enough. If we look at a chart like this one, um, give you a minute to kind of take it in. Our eyes first bounce to these big blocks of color. And those blocks of color kind of create curiosity. When we first hit this, we don't understand it. We don't know what it means, but those blocks of color seem interesting and we want to understand it. But the color isn't enough. And so our eyes jump to the next biggest thing, which is that big title on top. And that title gives us a good starting point and it tells us what we should be looking for. We're looking at Mongolians who are taller and lighter than the rest of the wrestlers. From there, we weave down through the rest of this chart until we finally end up at the headings and then the axes and we start to see this holistically. And then we kind of meander around for a little bit. <clears throat> as we're <clears throat> trying to understand things. Excuse me. So really, when we're constructing our visualizations, we need to have a map for our eyes to follow. And you can see how they're using color, they use size, and most importantly, the contrast with the background. The things that are more important really stand out, and the things that are less important fade back. If everything has the same visual weight, it hits us all at once and it's overwhelming and it's annoying and it's difficult to process. So let's talk about text for a little bit. So we'll come back to this visualization again, trying to help us understand just how uh, ancient uh, this sport is. And when you remove the labels that we had earlier, it doesn't do a very good job of it. We still have the timeline, it's largely obscured by this uh, mass of lines, but 
we understand what 250 years is. We can kind of internalize that and think what it uh, means. But when you overlay these other sporting events and significant historical events, it really brings it to life. You can say something started 250 years ago and I can kind of shrug it off and say, cool. But when you say something happened before the Declaration of Independence was signed, it's like, whoa, that's, that's really old. We have this visualization, again, like I said, uh, a bit difficult to process. There's a lot going on here. But what makes it possible is the text. Without the text, I'm left to wander these axes and understand what the color means and what the positions mean and what the circles mean. But having a title that's saying winning has gotten harder really helps me understand what they're trying to say here. And sometimes I think we shy away from this. We think if I'm giving someone a chart, I don't want to tell them what it means. That's their job to figure out. But the opposite is true. We really should tell them what the chart is about right there in the title. The chart is simply supplementing this point. It's adding color and credibility to that point. Next, I want to talk about color because I'm a designer and I love color. But when it comes to using color with data visualization, you have to follow some rules. There's some simple guidelines to follow. And the first thing you need to understand is that you're using color to represent data. There's data will come in two main flavors. I'm painting in pretty broad strokes here. But the first flavor is metrics. They're numbers and they have an order. And when you're using color to represent a number, you're really trying to visualize that numeric value. On the other side, we have dimensions or text. These are categorical and the color isn't trying to communicate anything except for this object is different than this other object. And so we need to be able to tell them apart. So let's look at metrics. Let's look at numbers and how we visualize those. We, because we're visualizing a sequence of numbers, we can think of it as being on a scale where we've got eight on one end, one on the other. Here we're using white to black. And it's this gradient, right? It's flowing from one to the other. And we could flip that, right? Orientation is a choice I have. But you should be aware that we naturally associate darker colors with larger values. So it's best practice to keep the dark end on the large numbers and the light end on the smaller numbers. We want to reduce the cognitive load. We want to make it as easy to understand these things as possible. So when they make assumptions, those assumptions turn out to be correct. Now we could of course add color to this. We don't have to just live in black and white. And what we're doing here is we're just taking a single slice of a color wheel from the darkest shade of blue to the lightest shade of blue. And that looks a little better, but we can really bring these to life by introducing a hue shift as well. So here we're not only traversing the dark to the light, but we're traversing the blue over to the green. This not only looks way better, but it's easier to understand the difference between any two points on the scale because you're moving lightness and hue. And of course you could do this with other colors like red and purple, but as a general rule, you wanna start with a cool color at your high values. Cool colors tend to be a little darker and then work your way to a warmer color, which tend to be a little lighter. Now, when you have more than one sequence you wanna visualize and, a meaning, and the, the meaningful data point is in the middle, uh, as it is in this example, um, you can use what's called a diverging scale. And what we're doing here is we're just taking two sequential scales and having them meet at a common point in the middle. A lot of people try and use these when there isn't a meaningful zero point, and so that's when you want to avoid them and just use a, a straight sequential scale. But when the middle matters, use a, a diverging scale. Now on to categories and dimensions. So if you remember, this is when we use color and the color doesn't mean anything. It's just a way of distinguishing one object from another. And when we do that, of course, we want things to look nice. Aesthetics is a big deal. And so we might develop a color scheme that looks like this, it takes a narrow slice of the color wheel. We've got five nice colors here and we start to move forward with this. But one of the shortcomings of this approach is there's not much of a visual difference between these. And that's the whole point. 
that we're trying to serve with these colors. Um, on the projector, you can see that like the first two colors there are really beginning to blend together. If there were, especially if there are points scattered around a chart, it would be very difficult to tell them apart. So we can go to the other sides of the house and say, well, readability, that's the goal here. Let's go all in. And we bounce back and forth from different sides of the color wheel, and we end up with this color scheme, which is hideous. <laughs> it's very functional. You're never going to confuse one color for the next, but you're not going to be terribly proud of a visualization that uses a color scheme like this. And if you wonder why some of the defaults colors in Excel and other programs look like this, this is why. And they're maximizing readability. So what do you do? Well, you could, like we did with the sequential data, change hue and lightness, right? This is a little more readable and it still looks really nice. But if you remember what we said about sequential colors and our natural association for darker values to be uh, higher numbers and lower, like lighter values to be high, uh, uh, smaller numbers, we're unintentionally giving our data meaning that we don't intend, right? These are supposed to be neutral uh, uh, representations. They're not supposed to carry any meaning in and of themselves. So this is not quite right, although it was a good thought. I advocate for a compromise to take a larger swath of the color wheel. You can still pick adjacent colors, but you need to get at least enough separation where these colors aren't going to be mistaken from one another. And that way you get not maximum readability, but good readability, and you still have some aesthetics that you're not going to be ashamed of. So in summary, we've got our sequential, our diverging and our categorical ways of using color. So come back to this one one last time. Here we can see sequential colors at work. Each line is given a color, and the color is determined by how high it is. This is what we call double encoding. You could take the colors out of these, and the chart would have the same meaning. But by double encoding, the lines begin to separate from one another, and we can see uh, the dark ones really pulling to the fore, while the lighter ones kind of fade back into the background. In this one, we have our diverging color scheme, where zero is an important part of the, the metric we're looking at. Anything above goes green, anything below goes orange. And then lastly, we have this, these categories. Um, so we have four categories, Japan, Mongolia, US, and then everyone else. And what I want to call attention to here is, one, they're only using four categories. When we use color for categories, we often find ourselves using five or six or 10 or 20, and it really doesn't scale well past five. Four is actually a really good place to, to be when you're using categories for color. The other thing they do is early on, they establish Japan as this uh, reddish orange color and Mongolia as this blue. They never leave that. Whenever they represent Japan for the rest of the article, they use that same association again, so I don't have to remap my mental associations with color every time I see a new chart. So if you're a designer, you're probably getting antsy to monkey around with some of these colors and your favorite design tools. If you're not, you're probably feeling a little apprehensive, like I don't know how to do this stuff. Here's some tools uh, on the left here that I find really useful. Chroma.js is a great way to create sequential and diverging color schemes. I want Hue is pretty effective at doing good categories. Um, and I want to call attention to Color Oracle as well. Um, if you ever are curious to know if your charts are going to be colorblind safe, um, Color Oracle will give you a quick view of that. And for anyone who's in the room who is colorblind, I apologize because this example from 538 is actually pretty bad practice when it comes to colorblindness. On the right, I've got some libraries called out. And what these are are uh, sets of colors that you can use out of the box. Color Brewer is the most famous. It was developed for cartographers, but it has sequential diverging and categorical color schemes you can use. Um, and these other ones are pretty cool too.
So can't get away from telling stories without talking about your audience. Your audience is actually really important. You need to know who they are and what their goals are. So they're, they're the whole reason for our story, right? So like I said, we need to know what their goals are. We need to know how familiar they are with the topic. This determines how much of a backstory we need to do. If this is a business proposal and everyone has been working on this for, for years, you don't have to uh, tee it up with much. With our sumo wrestling example, there's a lot of background that the audience needs to understand what's going on. Uh, daddy, data savviness or how uh, literate they are when it comes to reading charts. This is what Alberto Cairo refers to as graphicacy. Um, this determines kind of what sophistication your charts can be and uh, how deep you take them down the rabbit hole of where you arrived at these conclusions. You need to be sensitive to time. You can't take forever. You need to get your point across as quickly as possible. And then you need to think about how they're gonna consume their story. Uh, are they going to be self-service? Are they gonna be coming to a website or an app and consuming this stuff on their own? Or is it going to be in a video or a PowerPoint presentation where you're narrating them and walking them through it step by step? Uh, this will play a big role in how you tell the story. So if we go back to our Sumo example one last time, we know that the goal here is education, but also entertainment a little. Uh, if we're gonna sit through this whole thing on a sport we don't care about, they have to uh, hook our curiosity and entertain us. We're not gonna be very familiar with the topic as uh, Americans we typically don't follow Sumo Wrestling terribly close, but we are somewhat data savvy because we're on the 538 website, chances are, we, we like uh, charts and graphs. Um, they're specialized in long format content, so five to 15 minutes seems like a reasonable expectation. They're gonna be consuming this on their own, on their phone or their computer. So I wasn't sure what to call this last section. It's kind of the junk drawer of other stuff that didn't neatly fit into <laughs> these categories I created. So the first one I wanna talk about is leveraging natural and cultural associations. I've already talked about some of these, but I wanna list off some others to be aware of. Um, one of the most obvious is up is good, bad is down, right? You want our chart to go up and to the right. The future is ahead, the past is behind. Whenever you're representing time, make sure you keep that straight. If you find yourself reversing this, your chart can become very disorienting for your readers. Big, high contrast things are important and small, low cost, low contrast things are less important. Again, this is one of the things we talked about when we talked about visual hierarchy. Um, horizontal shapes, long horizontal shapes are stable. They're solid, they're not going anywhere. Whereas vertical shapes tend to feel a little more active, a little less stable, a little more volatile and we can leverage those emotions that are kind of happening behind the scenes when we're creating our visualizations. And last is actually a new one for me, and that's that the X axis is independent while the Y axis is dependent. So for instance, time, you typically see represented on the X because time marches on at a constant pace. It never changes, it's not affected by anything. Whereas the thing you're measuring over time, uh, say your win rate, is dependent on time and is gonna change. And so that's what you put on your, your horizontal, your Y axis. The next point is about meaning. We have this wonderful and dangerous habit of creating associations with things. When we see two lines like this, we say, man, those clearly are influencing one another. There is definitely a pattern between Nicholas Cage films and people drowning. <laughs> Even when we see the titles, we know that's ridiculous. Of course there isn't, but then we're like, but is it? Maybe there is. So when we are trying to make a point with a visualization, don't undermine it by showing an association that you're trying to prove isn't there. Because someone will walk away saying, I think they're wrong, I'm gonna dig into that. I'm gonna figure out why those things are correlated. And then of course we have to clean things up. By the way, that comes from a website called Spurious Correlations and they have a gold mine of fun charts. Next we wanna clean things up. Um, 
when we're working with tools, they are not typically very kind to us. When we give them raw data, it often comes out in something like this, even though what we want is something like this. Take the extra time to clean it up, make it easier for your audience to understand. When we're talking about a change over time, tell us what time it's relative to. Don't make me assume things and get that wrong. And when we're representing a sequence, uh, such as uh, time, a very common one, don't put it in these arbitrary weird buckets with bullet points. Represent it as it's experienced, as a linear path. Next, I want to talk about size. When we're representing uh, something as a size, our eyes understand, are actually really good at size. And we have a choice as to what we uh, use to represent that size. So if we're looking at these circles, we could associate that metric with the radius of the circle or the diameter or the circumference. But our eyes actually don't see any of those things. We don't process circles in that way. Instead, what we see, and this is true of almost any shape, is we see area. Our eyes are really good and our minds are really good at understanding area. And so take the time to make sure your metric is associated with area, even though that may require digging up some high school algebra or geometry to, to get to that number. Some tools do it automatically, but double check that. And the last thing I wanna call attention to is scales. Scales get neglected quite a bit, but we often get something like this where we have an alphabetical list. Nothing wrong with an alphabetical list when we're representing things, but usually that is the least meaningful way we can represent this. Here we have just eight countries represented in order. And cool, <laughs> that's about it. We can instead represent them in some sort of order. In this case, we're ranking them on military expenditures. This is better. Now I understand that Sweden spends more on their military than Brazil. These are made up, by the way. I don't know if that's true. <clears throat> um, but how much more valuable is it to put it on an interval scale where I can see the actual expenditure, where we see Sweden spending almost twice as much as Spain, who spends more than twice as much as these other countries that are clustered below. Now clearly this isn't the final visualization. This is just one component of it. By but by picking a scale with meaning that uh, maps to the insight you're trying to uh, share with someone, you're gonna be a lot more effective. <coughs> on another note on scales, <coughs> we sometimes find ourselves wanting side-by-side -side charts or three or four or a hundred, right? This is called small multiples. It's very useful. But when you do it, sometimes again, our tools will map the scale to fit the data. In this case, um, uh, United States and Germany have different values, but they look the same. And I might assume they are the same. And even a discerning audience member is going to say, okay, they're not the same, but what is this saying? Like, you have to do some mental gymnastics to make a sense of a chart like this. Don't make your audience do that mental gymnastics. Do it for them. Put everything on the same scale. Makes the story way cleaner. I can see that Germany bigger than the United States and I can move on with life. So last I want to talk about software. <clears throat> I've been alluding to it a little bit here. Um, Excel comes to mind, right? when it comes to making charts and graphs, they kind of have the, the corner on that spreadsheet market on the data visualization market. But there are other tools out there. Where Excel falls short is it's very template-based. If you want to get a specific chart out of Excel, even though you believe it to be the best chart for your data, it's sometimes so painful you give up and just go to a bar or a pie or whatever you can get quickly out of Excel. On the other hand, you can go to a tool like uh, D3. It's a JavaScript library that allows you to visualize things uh, very flexibly. You can do a lot of really cool things with D3. Unfortunately, you need to learn how to code, which is a pretty tall barrier to entry for a lot of us. Processing, another tool, again, very code-driven. And if you don't have access, if you don't have that ability, um, this is going to be uh, a little difficult for you to use. Now, there are other tools like Tableau, 
Tableau has a free version called Tableau Public that you can use. I'm a big fan of this one. It uh, brings a lot of the templates out of the picture so you have more flexibility. Uh, but formatting these can be a real bear, very difficult. And of course you have Adobe Illustrator, absolute creative freedom, but you gotta draw it by hand. And if you've got 300 plus data points, that's gonna be really time consuming and error prone. So what do you do? I wanna talk a little bit today about three projects um, that are happening right now. One is called Project Lincoln here at uh, Adobe. Um, we demoed uh, an early prototype of this at Max in 2017. Um, Data Illustrator is a, another research project, different product, same problem. Um, and we published a paper and there's an online prototype of this. And then Microsoft is working on this uh, with a product called Charticulator. And the problem here is how can I visualize my data flexibly without requiring code? And I want to share a quick demo of how you can do that in Illustrator. And hopefully this will work. And I'm scared to death of a live demo, so we're going to talk through this video instead. <laughs> <clears throat> so Data Illustrator runs in a browser. Um, and what you, you're doing here is you're drawing shapes and then mapping the visual attributes of those shapes to a data set. In this case, we're doing Boston weather. And we've got a bar, and the top of that bar represents the maximum temperature on that day, and the bottom of that bar represents the minimum temperature. The color represents the mean temperature, and then we're mapping blue circles to represent precipitation. And the size of that circle uh, gets bigger as there's more rain. So, the first thing we're going to do is uh, clear this out and we're going to start from scratch. We're going to build that chart and believe it or not, about three minutes. So we we're going to load up the data set. This is one of the sample data sets that's available. So you can try this on your own if you want. And we're going to draw that box. And that's uh, step one. Now we're going to repeat that box. So there's a little control in the upper right, repeat, and we want every one of our boxes to represent a day. In our data set, we have 365 days of weather in Boston. So now we have a box for every day and we can manipulate those, resize them. If, you're, if you've used Adobe XD, this control probably feels a bit familiar where you've got your repeat grid. Now we're actually gonna break that grid because we don't want those to be associated uh, with each other necessarily. We want to associate their position with time. So we're going to grab the x-axis here, that little uh, link icon, and map it to uh, date. So now uh, each of those boxes corresponds to a day of the year. Now we're going to grab the top of each box, and we're going to map that to our temperature, the max temperature specifically. And when we do that, we're going to get this really lovely bar chart. Much faster than drawing that by hand. <clears throat> Next, we're gonna grab the bottom of these lines and we're gonna map the, the Y of those to temperature again, but this time the minimum temperature. And we have the option to create a new scale or merge with the existing one. In this case, we wanna merge with temperature because temperature is temperature and we want them to share that scale. And now we've got those cool bars like we saw in the demo and we can adjust the size by playing with our axes there a bit. And these are overlapping a bit. So let's, we can go in and change the width of those so they don't collide so much. So we're gonna do that. The width is at six, we'll take it down to two. And they've got this uh, border on them. We can get rid of that border. Now they're invisible, they're still there. So let's add some color. We're gonna add uh, color. We're gonna map the color to the mean temperature, the average. And we start with this black and white scale because once again, we're mapping a sequence uh, numbers to color and we can go in and we can change this. This looks all, and feels a lot like a gradient editor in a design tool, right? So that our uh, high temperatures are associated with red and our low temperatures are blue, uh, maps very logically. And it looks pretty nice too. Now we need to get precipitation on this. 
So we're going to start over a bit and we're going to draw a circle this time. We're going to repeat that like we did with the bars so that we have a circle for every day. We can show those all in a grid, but we're going to break that grid here in a minute. First, we're going to get rid of the width and we're going to make those blue so they look like rain. We're also going to give it an opacity because these are going to be overlaying our uh, the rest of our chart and overlaying each other, and so we don't want them to completely obscure. So there's all 365 of them, but we're going to break that grid and we're going to map them to date. Uh, yeah. And we're gonna, after we map them to date, we wanna map their position to something that's relevant. We've gotta do, this is something that you don't have to do in the, the latest version, but we're lining up our scales here. Um, we want the Y to be associated with the mean temperature. So that they hit the, the center of that circle is the center of the bar that it's associated with, the day that it's associated with. And we want to merge with the existing scale again. We don't want to create a new one. We just need to make sure those are lined up and then we can move on to the last step here. Which is to take the area. We don't have to do the pi r squared. We built it in to precipitation. So if it didn't rain on a given day, that area is zero. And now we have our dots. We can adjust the size with this little control here on the left. And all that's left to do is put a title on this and we're ready to go. Cool, so that was Data Illustrator. Um, if you want to take it for a spin yourself, you can go to data-illustrator.com. It runs in the browser. It's only tested on Chrome, so it's just a prototype. So use Chrome, be kind. Um, on the gallery tab on the website, you'll see a whole list of videos, including the one we just watched. And you can not only watch the video, but you can open an example which will open up that visualization in Data Illustrator with all the mappings there, and you can uh, use that as a starting point if you want to riff on a visualization. So if this is something that interests you, I encourage you to get involved. Um, there's a number of groups uh, nationally. There's the Data Visualization Society and the Data Visualization Book Club, actually international groups. And then locally, there's the Utah Data Viz Club which has uh, quarterly meetups. My fun little gifts come from DVDP. You can find him on Instagram. He does some pretty cool stuff. And I want to give credit to some people who've written books that have inspired me and uh, given me feedback on this presentation as I built it out. Mostly I want to thank you for coming. And if you have any feedback for me, uh, my uh, DMs are open on Twitter. I'm at Alan G. Wilson. Uh, I'd love to hear anything you have to share. Thank you.